Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So I'm making another video to um, talk about a couple of things. First of all, some people have been making some requests for me to make a video about how I came to Islam. So I will go through that. And I also have a couple messages. So I guess, oh, where should I start? Well. I was raised a Christian, and my dad is actually a minister, and we attended church every Sunday when I was young, and I always had like a strong sense of moral values and all that sort of stuff, and I always had such a passion and love for God, and I've always loved the Prophet Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, but I just, there was a lot of questions and a lot of things that didn't make sense to me. Like the Trinity, for example, just never made sense to me. And kind of not seeing God as one, even though I know in Christianity they say he is one, but it just it didn't make sense to me. And a lot of inconsistencies in the Bible, and no offense to any Christian out there at all. And um, yeah, and I just, I looked at people in society and the way young people my age are acting, people that claimed to love God and would preach about it all the time, but then go out and do these things that were completely against their religion. Not to say that people of all religions do that, I'm sure, and I've seen that as well in all different religions, Hindus, Jewish people, Muslims, everybody. But I think I had a couple good friends and they seem to really be grounded and have a lot of a good sense of morals and just be so peaceful and blessed and happy. And they were Muslim, and they seemed to have this closeness to God that I really admired, and he was so important to them. And this got me interested. Now, in the beginning, we used to debate a lot, actually. I would defend my views, and my friend would defend theirs. And I was so stubborn, and I would listen, but I didn't really listen. I was more just thinking about what I was going to say next, instead of really thinking about what they were telling me. And I went over to one of my one Muslim friend's houses just to study, and they were showing me, they were just talking to me about Eid, and talking to me about, um, about being Muslim and telling me all these things, and I got really interested, and I was kind of starting to grow an interest for Islam. It just, it, I don't know what it was, just something made me, you know, want to learn more. And it was weird because I was completely against it before, and I just had this complete turnaround, this complete change. And the more I started to learn, the more sense it started to make. I actually went and visited another convert sister. And she told me a lot that was like, wow, it just it explained all the things that didn't make sense to me in Christianity. And Islam had no mistake, no mistakes. It was It's perfect in my eyes, and I'm sure in a lot of people's. And it just brought me such peace, like peace of my mind. And it just, making a sacrifice for Allah and really taking time out of my day to pray and things like that just really felt like I was worshipping in the right way. I wasn't just living my life how I wanted to and I kind of had God on the side. God was first, always first. And this made me feel a lot closer and it just felt really right. And something I didn't see a lot, I didn't see a lot as, and didn't feel a lot as a Christian. And I went and visited the mosques um, a couple times and that is amazing. I tell any person out there who's interested in Islam, just go to the mosque and listen to a good lecture. And your eyes will be opened because there are some really good good lectures out there that I heard at the mosque that were just incredible and really, really touched my heart and soul. And this just kind of pulled me even more towards it. And it was a very, very slow process. I didn't tell my friends. I only, I only told one of my friends, my close friend that I was interested and I didn't tell my family because I was scared of people judging me and I was scared because my dad is a minister and not because I thought he would be mad because my father is an amazing great person and I know he would never 
force me to do anything. But I thought he would be sad, and I didn't want to break his heart. And so I started learning the prayers, and I slowly I started to pray, and this brought me such joy and peace. And my life seemed to get a lot better, and I was just a lot more happy. It just it filled this hole inside of me that I think a lot of people have. Pe like people have this hole inside of them naturally, and we try to fill it with all these things. We try to fill it with the drugs and adult and premarital sex and alcohol, buy like money, buying all this stuff, material things, and maybe that'll fill it for a day, a month, years, but it won't truly fill it and you won't be happy. And the only thing that can is God and I finally, I finally felt like it, I was whole, like it was filled. And that was what was really, really amazing. And everybody in the Muslim community was absolutely incredible and such nice people and welcome me with open arms and I guess my next step was to tell my family and so I told my friend I had mentioned it to my dad slowly and my dad was kind of he was sad but more than sad he would ask me a lot of questions like oh so you don't believe Jesus died on the cross you don't believe Jesus is God and these questions hurt me because he made me feel like I was forsaking like I was doing something bad to Jesus but I wasn't because I still loved him and he's still a great prophet and I still have that love for him but he made me feel like I was abandoning him or something and he asked me really tough questions and that was tough but he's accepted it now and I know he's still sad but he's actually reading the Quran and learning more about Islam and seeing how many lies are told out there and my mom on the other hand she was more afraid I guess you could say she has that sort of stereotype you know she thought I was gonna go and get kidnapped and not be allowed back and these crazy things but once I um, explained to her that none of that's true and showed her a lot of things she supports me a lot now and it's amazing it's great and inshallah that'll continue so that's a very short condensed version of why I converted and maybe I'll make another longer more detailed story later I'm pretty tired I just finished midterms so the next thing I wanted that I wanted to talk about was those of you who are born into Islam like I'm I know we are all born Muslims but those of you who are raised Muslim I see a lot of people who are raised Muslim and they believe in God and they have this amazing blessing to be raised that way because I'm telling you it is extremely hard to live with a family who doesn't share your values it's very very tough it makes you feel alone sometimes Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown coming to you with another episode of Interfaith Issues. Today we're going to continue the discussion of doctrinal differences between Christianity and Islam and how we rectify those differences. And the topic of discussion today is the Trinity. Now, to begin with, it's helpful if we look at the Christian sources and what they say about this concept of the Trinity. The New Westminster Dictionary of the Bible states, quote, the word does not occur in scripture, referring to the word Trinity. Quote, the word does not occur in scripture. According to the HarperCollins Encyclopedia of the Bible, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity as such is not revealed 
in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. That's the HarperCollins Encyclopedia of the Bible. The doctrine of the Trinity, as such, is not revealed in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. Well, this makes us wonder, if the word Trinity does not exist in the Bible, and if the doctrine is not revealed in the Bible, where did it come from? And why do so many people believe in it? And that is something we really have to explore. Now, the concept of the Trinity was actually derived by Tertullian, a lawyer in Carthage around the year 220 CE. Tertullian came up with the concept of the co-sharing of divinity between God as the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. It has to be pointed out, this concept was derived 220 years after the, the calendar started, after the zero point of the calendar. Now, the mission of Jesus Christ was roughly from the year 34 through the year 37, roughly. So this means that the concept of the Trinity was derived a little bit less than 200 years after the mission of Jesus Christ. That's a long time. That's 200 years of other Christians never having even heard of the concept. It is no surprise then to find that early Christianity was at odds over the concept of the Trinity. Some people propose it, other sects of Christianity vehemently denied it. And so you had early Christian sects who followed the unity of God as taught by Jesus Christ, and you had others trying to, trying to work the Trinity into the established church doctrine. According to Hans Kung, one of the leading theologians of this time, quote, throughout the New Testament, whereas there is belief in God the Father, in Jesus the Son, and in God's Holy Spirit, there is no doctrine of one God in three persons, three modes of being, no doctrine of a triune God, a trinity. Bluntly put, according to Harper's Bible Dictionary, quote, the formal doctrine of the trinity as it was defined by the great church councils of the 4th and 5th centuries, is not to be found in the New Testament. Harper's Bible Dictionary. This is concerning, especially when we find such comments as, quote, the Trinitarian formula was shaped in a highly complex, sometimes contradictory, and at all times wearisome process of thought. Again, that is from Hans Kung. Now, I think most people know that the Nicene Creed was put forth at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. We find this comment, quote, a profession of faith agreed upon, although with some misgivings, because of its non-biblical terminology by the bishops of Nicaea, to defend the true faith against Arianism. A number of very important points in this quotation. Number one, the profession of faith, the Nicene Creed, was arrived at with some misgivings. They weren't sure about it. Why? Because of its non-biblical terminology. It's not mentioned in the Bible. The concept of the Trinity was derived by extra-biblical terminology. Which means what? Which means a bunch of people came up with the concept. Not based on what we find in the Bible, but because they proposed it, they liked it, they ratified it. The other thing that is important to learn from this quotation is that the bishops of Nicaea derived the Trinity to defend their faith against Arianism. This is a very important point. Arius was the bishop who put forth the teachings contrary to the Trinity. 
he was the one who said, well, if God is the Father and Jesus is the Son, there must have been a time when the Father preceded the Son. So they cannot have been co-eternal. How can the Son be co-eternal if he comes from the Father? There must have been a time when the Father predated the Son. Arius argued for Unitarian belief, the belief in God as one God and only God as one God, as Jesus Christ himself professed. Three places in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is asked about the greatest commandment, and his reply is, No, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Nowhere is the Trinity elaborated, as you understand from the quotes I have already read. Now, why did all of this happen? Why did the world of Christianity feel a need to unite upon one of these creeds? On one hand, you had Arius with his Unitarian Christianity and the other bishops and, and priests who followed Arian Christianity. On the other hand, you had the Trinitarian proposal. What was the need to resolve this? What was the need to unify the Christians under one belief? Well, the need was that the emperor of Rome at that time, Emperor Constantine, saw the Roman Empire torn apart from within by religious infighting. Now, at the same time, the Roman Empire was waging wars on a number of different fronts. And the fact of the matter was that the empire was crumbling. It could not withstand the forces of being torn apart, both on multiple war fronts and being torn apart within by religious fractionation. So the driving force was that Emperor Constantine basically forced his empire to be united under one religion. And it just so happens that Trinitarianism became prevalent not by theology, but by force. Now, we find that it is interesting to note that although Trinitarian Christianity was established during the time of Constantine, at least for some time, it did not remain established. Meaning what? Meaning this. Constantine died. He left behind two sons, Constans and Constantius. Now, Constans was the stronger of the two. He ruled one half of the empire, whereas Constantius ruled the other half. Constans imposed his will, imposed the Trinitarian Church upon the entire empire. So, the empire was converted to Trinitarian thought during the time of Constantine. Constantine died. His son, Constans, imposed Trinitarian belief upon his brother, Constantius, who was an Arian. But guess who died first? That's right, Constans. As soon as Constans died, Constantius took over and imposed Arian, Unitarian Christianity, upon the empire. So we're back to Unitarian Christianity. But it doesn't end there. After Constantius died, we have Julian assuming the throne. Julian tried to return the Roman Empire to the paganism it had practiced before. He didn't succeed because he didn't live for very long. When he passed, his sons took over, and again, they were divided. One ruled one half of the empire under Trinitarian Christianity. Valens ruled the other half of the empire under Arian Christianity. It wasn't until their passing that Trinitarian Christianity became uh, firmly established and it remained the what was considered the Orthodox Christianity of the realm. But the point is that it had a fluctuating history. It was not agreed upon unanimously. Now the Nicene Creed was rendered authoritative at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And after that, it became considered authoritative. It 
however, arrived at this state in such a convoluted manner than, that we find comments such as the following. From the New Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, It is difficult in the second half of the 20th century to offer a clear, objective, and straightforward account of the revelation, doctrinal evolution, and theological elaboration of the mystery of the Trinity. Trinitarian discussion, Roman Catholic, as well as other, presents a somewhat unsteady silhouette. According to the quote that I just read before the break, and I will repeat it, from the New Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, Trinitarian discussion, Roman Catholic as well as other, presents a somewhat unsteady silhouette. Well, unsteady indeed. Why? Because, quote, the formula itself does not reflect the immediate consciousness of the period of origins. Now, isn't that a comforting thought? To know that Trinitarian Christianity is following a formula that does not represent the consciousness of the period of origins. In other words, it doesn't represent the teachings of Jesus Christ, the disciples, the early Christians. But to continue, the formula itself does not reflect the immediate consciousness of the period of origins. It was the product of three centuries of doctrinal development. It is this contemporary return to the sources that is ultimately responsible for the unsteady silhouette. In other words, everything would have been fine. It would have, the Trinity would have looked fine and been easy to explain except for the one problem of the fact that it did not agree with early Christianity. It did not agree with the teachings of Jesus Christ. This is what led to the unsteady silhouette. As if that is not enough, the New Catholic Encyclopedia continues as follows. Question. The formulation one God and three persons was not solidly established, certainly not fully assimilated into Christian life and its profession of faith prior to the end of the fourth century. Wow. We are saying it took three to 400 years. We had to step 300 to 400 years away from the period of origins before the Trinity not only could be derived, but implemented into Christian faith. But, to return to the quote, but it is precisely this formulation that has first claim to the title, the Trinitarian dogma. Amongst the apostolic fathers, there had been nothing even remotely approaching such a mentality or perspective. It's hard to think of what to say beyond that. We have the New Catholic Encyclopedia admitting that it took three to four hundred years to derive the doctrine, admitting that, quote, among the apostolic fathers there had been nothing even remotely approaching such a mentality or perspective, but that is the creed that they stick to nonetheless. Well, if we sit back and we ask ourselves, where is there a religion that follows what Jesus Christ himself actually professed? Where is there a religion that did not go through the theological gymnastics to take three to four hundred years to derive a doctrine that was unknown to the apostolic fathers? Where is there a religion that follows the monotheism that Jesus Christ professed when he said, Know, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one? Well, if you answered Islam, you would be correct. Let me quote from the Holy Quran, quote, O people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of Allah anything but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of Allah and his word, which he bestowed on Mary and a spirit proceeding from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers. Do not say Trinity, 
desist. It will be better for you. For Allah is one God. Glory be to him. Far exalted is he above having a son. To him belong all things in the heavens and on earth. And enough is Allah as a disposer of affairs. In the Holy Quran, Allah also warns, quote, O people of the book, exceed not in your religion the bounds of what is proper trespassing beyond the truth, nor follow the vain desires of people who went wrong in times gone by, who misled many and strayed themselves from the even way. We may want to delve into the issue further. There are pages and pages in which we can look into the matter. We can quote other scholars. Bart D. Ehrman, in his comments on the teachings of Paul, Quote, in particular, the adoptionists considered Paul one of the most prominent authors of our New Testament to be an arch-heretic rather than an apostle. We can quote Joel Carmichael, quote, we are a universe away from Jesus. If Jesus came only to fulfill the law and the prophets, if he thought that not an iota, not a dot would pass from the law, that the cardinal commandment was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that no one was good but God. What would he have thought of Paul's handiwork? And let us remember that it was Paul who spoke the words or proposed the ideology that the Pauline theologians grabbed a hold of and converted to the Trinitarian formula. In the words of two famous authors, to begin with, in the words of Dr. Johannes Weiss, quote, hence the faith in Christ, as held by the primitive churches and by Paul, was something new in comparison with the preaching of Jesus. It was a new type of religion. And if I have not shown anything else, it is exactly that. What Jesus Christ professed the oneness of God, what early Christians believed, the oneness of God, what the apostolic fathers believed, the oneness of God was not the formula that was later derived by the Christian church to become the Trinitarian formula. Bajent and Lee summarized the situation as follows. This is a rather long quote, but I feel I cannot say it better. Quote, in all the vicissitudes that follow, it must be emphasized that Paul is, in effect, the first Christian heretic. And that his teachings, which became the foundation of later Christianity, are a flagrant deviation from the original, or pure form, extolled by the leadership. Eisenman has demonstrated that James emerges as the custodian of the original body of teachings, the exponent of doctrinal purity and rigorous adherence to the law. The last thing he would have had in mind was founding a new religion. Paul is doing precisely that. Which theology won the day? I think we all know. In this time, the Trinitarian Church is predominant over the Christian world. We do find Unitarian churches, but they are very much in the minority. When we approach the Trinitarian and ask them for evidence, where's the evidence for the concept of the Trinity? The one piece of evidence they always hold up is the first epistle of John 5, 7 through 8. It is in this passage where it is quoted as mentioning the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. I will quote exactly, to be precise, quote, for there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Sounds good? One problem. It's not in Scripture. It's in the translation. The interpreter's Bible states, 
This verse in the King James Version is to be rejected. It appears in no ancient Greek manuscript, nor is it cited by any Greek father. Dr. Schofield, in his Bible, the Schofield Reference Bible, states, it is generally agreed that this verse has no manuscript authority and has been inserted. Multiple other scholars say the same. Professor Metzger, that these words are spurious and have no right to stand in the New Testament is certain. How did it come into being? The Johannine comma, as it is known, 1 John 5, 7 through 8, was written into the margin of scripture by a scribe. Somebody liked it, they took it from the margin, they put it into the text, and it carried on from there. But now, with the honesty of modern scholarship, we know that this was an insertion by a scribe, and it did not exist in the original scripture. Hence the reason why Christian scholars themselves are calling for it to be rejected. Hence the reason why it has been removed or modified in the Revised Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, the New American Standard Bible, the Good News Bible, the New English Bible, the Jerusalem Bible, Darby's New Translation, and the list goes on. Honest Christian scholarship has recognized that this verse does not stand up to critical analysis. There are other pieces of evidence which are held up as weaker elements of support. I would just say that in the same manner that I have presented refutation for the evidence that the, the church presents otherwise, they all have their answers. I would invite anybody watching who wants to learn those answers and learn more about this subject, please go to my website, www.leveltruth.com. That's L-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H.com. You will find my books, Misguided, Godded, other articles and unpublished chapters. You will find everything that I have said and a great deal more on the subject. But for now, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown concluding this episode of Interfaith Issues. Looking forward to the next time we meet. Hope to see you then. Best wishes and peace.